Houston. Hoping everybody can uh, hear me right now. This is Mike Wolfoff. We're here for Top 10 Internal Investigation Problems. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, use the um, chat function or put the, use the questions format uh, form and please feel free to write any questions. I'll send you the slides again. Um, if you could send the slides to uh, send me an email and I'll send the slides to your email uh, right after this. I usually get to that every day. Also, this will be posted on the YouTube channel uh, in case you need um, uh, to listen to it or you want somebody else to listen to it uh, and to go through uh, the show here. Um, you know, it was hard actually to pick out the top 10, but some of them were pretty obvious. Some weren't as much, but uh, uh, in terms of top 10 internal investigation problems. Uh, and I apologize for uh, jumping on a little bit late. Um, in any event, uh, when we look at the function of internal investigations, what what is really important is um, to consider the range of internal investigation functions that we have. For example, uh, we have our major cases where we're minimizing liability to protect the company, sort of like your GM case, your Walmart case. And uh, those are important cases, obviously, in how you conduct an internal investigation. And, um, and there are different sets of risks. Day to day, we also have an important set of functions. Uh, and I think there's even more focus from the Justice Department. And even when you read through the FCPA guidance, you see how important they think that it is the company culture and compliance function. So they want to see an adequately organized, funded, operational internal investigations function that also informs, comes back to uh, informing and improving your uh, compliance program. So there are the ideas here we're getting at is that you want to make sure that you encourage a speak up culture, but that you communicate their consequences for it, and you want to create an ethical work environment where people feel so vested in their company or your company that they want to report, they will report somebody else's misconduct. That always is one good uh, indicator of a um, of an ethical company is how willing are people to you know in, uh, enforce the standard themselves when they see somebody else uh, committing this conduct. So internal investigations, basically, we have our benefits for purposes, which are one, you know, we want to make sure you get the information quickly for the important decision makers. Obviously, when you have a suspicion something is going on, you want to find out. Or when you have something that is going on, you want to stop it. Um, when you have conduct that you think is illegal that's going on, you want to stop it. Uh, so that's why you, uh, you have to investigate, obviously, to see what exactly the conduct is. Uh, you want to resolve your code violations and legal violations in a consistent way. You want to promote, like I said, a speak-up culture where an ethical work environment exists. And you want to improve your program. Investigations obviously can reveal weaknesses in your program or issues that you haven't addressed adequately. So you want to make sure that you do that uh, as well. So one of the issues that I don't see as much written about, and the reason I started as problem number one, is do you need an internal investigation? Um, look, there are times when employees raise concerns and let's say you learn of something and the question is whether or not you even need to launch a formal investigation. Now, I'm going to be talking mostly in this context about your serious violations, okay? And this is a, a question, problem number one, is this is whether or not you really do need to launch an investigation. And by that I mean, you know, sort of taking all the triggers that are involved and uh, pulling them all. In other words, going to the board, going to senior management, to the CEO, saying we've got a problem, Houston, and we need to look at this particular problem and we're gonna have to take and employ all the necessary procedures that we have to do with regard to uh, an internal investigation problem. So, 
Um, and what I think is interesting is that people need to take a little bit more time and think about does this require um, uh, you know, a formal internal investigation. Not every situation does, nor do you run into the government. Uh, I, I can tell you about one particular client who prior to you know, learning about this or whatever, I wasn't involved in this, you know, had 20 incidents where uh, there was some T&E travel and entertainment problem and they ended up doing the full board thing. They spent $3 million investigating it and people later questioned, why did we even do this? And they reported it to the government. So what I am saying is we need to do something a little bit different here and think at the first step, what do we really need to launch a formal internal investigation? I would attempt to make this akin to, uh, and I'm going to talk about really what I think the solution to that is. In other words, there is what I would call sort of like a preliminary inquiry. It's like what the government does. Before we opened, let's say, a formal investigation when I was a prosecutor, there were times we did preliminary inquiry, and those were to determine whether there was enough evidence. So. Whether you need an investigation or not, you need to look at these issues. What's the nature and the scope of the problem? What's the potential you know, uh, legal implications and what can happen to that? And is there a significant risk of litigation? In other words, is there a way for people, uh, do you think you could get sued on this? And in other words, there has to be some benefit or reason to do the internal investigation. So when I what I say is there should be some threshold of evidence you need, and I use the analogy of a preliminary inquiry. In other words, uh, you don't just take any allegation and say, okay, that's it, we've got to do an internal investigation. There has to be some determination of whether or not there is sufficient evidence to launch the investigation. Now, this is a risk, you know, there are obviously risks if you don't dig further enough and you could have uh, Dug further enough and could have discovered something that's good. But you also have to be careful of your resources here. So, in other words, if you avoid an issue by failing to conduct a preliminary inquiry or you don't dig that one extra little level, you don't want to be caught there like Walmart and accused of, hey, you knew there was a problem and you were just trying to cover it up. So, in this uh, situation, it's hard to balance, but you have to determine, you have to set up, and this is a very difficult problem, uh, and there's not enough written about it, and it's interesting that people just assume you need to have an investigation. And that is, uh, you, you've got to make sure you paper this and do it carefully enough, and oftentimes, I hate to tell you, you need to use outside counsel to say, look, there's an independent judgment here that we did not need to launch an investigation. Uh, and it avoids what I uh, wrote here, the appearance of sweeping it under the rug, and you don't want to create future controversies, so you use outside counsel to sort of bless that decision. In the end, I know it sounds like you're going to waste money on outside counsel, you're going to save money in the sense that um, you're going to avoid an unnecessary in, uh, internal investigation. So don't just assume that when you get an allegation or you dig a little bit, you think that there's something there that you have to do that, uh, you know, long, go to the running to the board and all that stuff. You have to be very careful about pulling the triggers and when you do, do uh, when you do get into a serious uh, investigation. Um, obviously, if you know the Walmart facts, it was there was much more to it than. Uh, just you know, one simple allegation. But I'm, I use that only in, in, a, in a sense to sort of symbolize what what a real problem could look like. Okay, so uh, that's our problem number one. And so uh, let's assume you know we're gonna we're we're getting further into this, uh, and we do have sufficient evidence. Then my question, uh, another issue that comes up is. Is our complainant a whistleblower? Is the is this person, and you don't know in advance, they don't have a little thing on their head that says, hey, I'm a whistleblower. They are your complainant, but you don't know if they are a whistleblower to begin with, meaning you know, uh, that they are you know, going to seek, let's say, the SEC recovery or anything like that, or they may turn into a whistleblower, and that, to me, is what you want to avoid. 
if somebody's going to be a whistleblower and they've already got their lawyer and they're running to the government, you're going to, you know, you'll quickly pick that up uh, from your interactions with the, the people uh, and the lawyer, plaintiff's whistle, uh, lawyer. If the complainant walks in alone and seems legitimately, you know, remember that most people want to have report to the company and have the company respond. That's all they want. They want to be heard. It's not that hard a thing. It's like a child. Your child wants to be heard by the mother or father. That's it. If the issue is raised by the whistleblower, obviously, and you think that there if this person is a whistleblower, this is your problem number two. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to handle this issue? Um, you have a unique situation because there is a 120-day period. It's not a, a set in stone. But from the reporting of the concern within the company, you, the, the whistleblower has an incentive, not a requirement. It's always, I'm amazed how many people get this wrong. It's an incentive to wait and give the company 120 days to, to respond. Well, and the reason is that the size of the award, one of the factors that goes into the size of the award for the whistleblower is whether or not they waited that 120 day period. Sometimes they'll, they think they've got such a great case, they just run, they don't care. They know that they're gonna get a big award and they just say, I'm running to the SEC. I'm not waiting 120 days. So you don't know what they're going to do. At the point they walk in, you set up a meeting, your first meeting with a complainant and they walk in with an attorney or you're contacted by an attorney, et cetera, et cetera. You know you're dealing with a whistleblower. You know you're dealing with a 120-day period. You know that you've got to do something. You've got to act quickly and carefully. And hopefully, and I know this falls on deaf ears usually most of the time, because I, I don't get much inquiry on this. I don't get much discussion about this. I don't hear much discussion about it. But there should be a triage program of some sort in how you're going to deal with with whistleblowers. In other words, a protocol that's in place. The most important thing is to always just make sure that you are always, that you make sure that you always are attending to uh, and reiterating that there is no retaliation, there is no retaliation uh, policy, and you have a non-retaliation uh, policy as well. So you know what you're going to do. Uh, with a whistleblower complaint before you get one. You need a protocol that's in place to do that. Uh, so make sure that you do that, okay? And the incidents, and uh, I don't know if you've seen this lately, but there was just a report that was done by LRN which said that the incidence of whistleblower retaliation is on the rise. And that, to me, is just bad business. If you want to, if you want to do things stupidly, then start retaliating against whistleblowers. And that's because there's so much more pressure and the monetary amounts that are involved, the 10 to 30 percent uh, type of recovery could be huge. And people were, you know, really, I think some of the, you know, the lawyers are sort of ginning up the fears. And I think that that is not good because I think it's filtering down to this retaliation uh, into the company culture. And that's a real, real bad thing. So uh, you meet with your whistleblower, you treat him or her with respect, you listen to them, you reassure them on your commitment to a full investigation. You keep them apprised of the nature of you know, where you're going with your investigation, how things are going. Um, you want to make sure that you reassure the whistleblower of you know, the company's commitment to the full investigation. And you keep the whistleblower informed, always, always without detail. Do not tell the whistleblower, we're talking to this person, we're talking to that person. If anything, ask them questions that throws them off. Uh, you know, who, who, what, in other words, I would always ask the whistleblower, who are people you think we should talk to to investigate this? Uh, and do that in the beginning and write down everything. Uh, you know, keep a record of what was said. Write a memo. We met with them. This is what we discussed, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that you have to do besides meeting with the whistleblower and dealing with the whistleblower is uh, to figure out what you're going to do about the government. Because at this point, you've got a 120-day clock running. You know that they're going to go, let's say, to the government, or you're worried they're going to go. And the question is whether or not you should go. 
uh, into the government and preempt them or not. Now, the situation where that's going to occur to me is rare because the benefit of preempting them and going in as opposed to, uh, you know, I look at this as a marginal issue. It's my economics background, but uh, marginal is an issue. What's the benefit that you're going to gain by going in first versus, let's say the whistleblower goes in first, reports it, then the government contacts you and you go in and you say, look, we're fully cooperative. We're fully cooperative. We're doing this. We already talked to the whistleblower. We're doing this, that, and the other. I don't think there are going to be many situations where you are going to want to preempt the whistleblower unless the risks are really serious. And I don't know. In my mind, a lot of times I'm going to sit back and I may let the whistleblower go in first and then come in and do a very good presentation to the government about how far along we are on this issue already. So I'm going to make sure that I know. So the point here is that I know or take out a calculator and try to calculate the risk that a complainant will turn into a whistleblower. Uh, and I'm going to uh, sort of factor that into my whole internal investigation plan. I may prioritize an investigation for that reason. Uh, there are many things that I can do in this context in terms of handling uh, a whistleblower complaint. So that's problem number two. Problem number three that comes up is who should be walled off? And I guess this is a subsidiary of an issue of, uh, of independence. And an investigation is valuable because it is independently conducted. Uh, think about the uh, Governor Chris Christie investigation done by Gibson Dunn, which was led by a friend of his uh, from years back in the government days when they were both in the Bush administration. Um, they were buddies. And then all of a sudden, she conducts an investigation for him. And boom, the value of that investigation, you might as well take it and throw it in the trash. All the millions that he may have spent is worth nothing because that investigation was tainted. So in the same way, you want to keep people who are, the way you undermine an invest, internal investigation quickly is let's say the general counsel is implicated only in this sense. So I only, and I don't mean to cast aspersions on general counsels, but uh, the general counsel was involved in the legal issue and was involved with the uh, some of the uh, you know paperwork that was involved saw a lot of the paperwork was involved in some of the judgment calls that general counsel there's no way that general counsel should be involved in the investigation and when i say involved that means they should be walled off that means they get no documents that means they get no they are treated as an individual witness in a case and a subject remember the three the three sort of statuses. You have witnesses, and this is from my prosecutor days, you have witnesses who see things, you have subjects whose conduct is being investigated, and then you have targets, people who you know or who prove uh, have substantial evidence to show that they committed an offense. That's what I'm saying. So the question is, if that person's conduct is under investigation in any way, in other words, if they touched it, they're going to, you're going to be looking at what they did, you're going to be asking about what they did, then that individual has to be excluded. And you have to have this in place before the conflict situation arises. So you wall people off. Now, people can be brought back over the wall as time goes on. If you reach the point where the general counsel, you can clear the general counsel, then you let the general counsel in at that point. Doesn't, uh, doesn't mean you're walled off forever. Status can change uh, as well. But you want to do as much as you can in terms of documenting and sticking to this wall concept to keep those people out of it that shouldn't be involved in. How did Walmart get in trouble? They got in trouble because people, the person who was running the investigation in the end was the person who was being investigated. So uh, in the end, you have to take these steps to make sure that you wall off those people who may be uh, involved. Okay, so who should conduct? Who should conduct? And you can see that here uh, we already talked about this, but who should conduct the investigation? Uh, you want to make sure in most serious cases you're going to use outside counsel. You're going to have them uh, in, you know, inside. You're, you're going to have outside counsel. 
because internal counsel can't conduct the investigation without um, an objective viewpoint, or their or their uh, investigation, the chief compliance officer was somehow involved in some of these uh, judgment calls. So in that situation, the outside counsel is going to be needed. The other thing is where attorney-client privilege is important, you're going to use uh, outside counsel, uh, and the reason you're going to do that uh, is it's easy to uh, preserve the attorney-client privilege, um, and, and et cetera. Now, one of the issues that you're also going to have is you may have outside counsel for more than one person. In other words, more than one entity here. The company itself may have an outside counsel, but so the board or the audit committee may, in that situation, they're so worried about whether or not the company counsel is going to do a proper job in the board, which is or the audit committee that's responsible for overseeing the investigation, may have their own counsel as well. And that way that uh, the oversight counsel is going to review the work by the company counsel and make sure that it meets the board's requirements or the audit committee's uh, or compliance committee's uh, requirements or if you have a special committee that's set up as well. So in this situation, you're going to be uh, you know, caught in a situation like this where you have, where you're going to make sure that you're going to have two sets of outside counsel. And this is where the money starts to flow, believe me. So problem number five that we get to now is should you disclose something to the government? Should you disclose the internal investigation or the potential violation uh, to the government? And this is really, uh, I think this is um, sort of a, it, it, the issue I think is bubbling up again. And the reason it's bubbling up is that the government now, you can see recent statements about that the SEC and DOJ are saying, you better come in, you get a big benefit, please come in, not please, but you, you know, you should come in and tell us about what you're discovering. And I think what's going on is they're getting a sense right now that people are, and it's something I've advocated for a long time, rethinking or going through the non-reporting scenario. In other words, fixing your problem. You discover a problem, you fix the problem, you enhance your compliance program and paper it, make sure you have all the documents related to this, and you even put in a super duper uh, compliance program enhancement, and you avoid disclosure to the government. So you avoid disclosure to the government. So in that way, um, in that way, uh, you avoid going through the threshold of the government's reporting structure. And one, because one of my concerns always is that once you go in and you start to talk to DOJ, you're done. You've lost control. It's up to DOJ now. They'll look at it. They'll tell you what to do. You've got to do it. You've got to report back. Then you've got to argue on the margins about what the proper resolution is. You're trying to get a declination. You're trying to, you're living for that declination. And they say, sorry, you owe us money. You can't do anything. You're stuck. Okay? So the non-reporting scenario, they're getting, a, they're getting signals that this is becoming a more active, more active, and more plausible scenario where companies are avoiding talking to them. Now, the one thing about not talking or not reporting is you risk, you, there's a definitely, you have to take into account if you don't um, report but you terminate people, you fire people as part of your remediation program, they have every incentive at that point because they're mad as hell at you and the company to go and tell the government about it. And that's the other thing you have to do. You, the non-reporting scenario would work great if there was no risk of detection other than the government finding out on its own. But here's what happens. The whistleblowers, okay, the whistleblowers could come out, and there's a risk of reporting if you terminate people. If you terminate an officer or an employee, those, you know, how many times have we seen investigations that are started in response to allegations made by a disgruntled employee? I always like the word disgruntled. The other factor that you have to take into account is what is the scale of the alleged problem, okay? Because you do have one other constraint here. There is a materiality uh, disclosure issue which goes to the SEC uh, disclosure requirements, statutory requirements with regard to disclosure. 
and you do have an obligation, or your company has an obligation to disclose material violations. Now, if the scale of the problem, and my situation, my advice generally is, once you get out of a particular, you know, sort of size of a problem and get to a more systemic thing, or a really sort of wholesale problem uh, with regard to uh, some of your operations, then you may be forced to disclose to the government because the scale becomes so significant that it may become a materiality issue as to the range of misconduct that occurred. You had theft in the, you know, in the, in the range of millions. Uh, this may undermine your ability to certify as to your internal controls and the efficacy of them. So th this is sort of number five is a difficult issue. Uh, but to me, these are the four most, you know, relevant factors that you have to take into account as you're looking at the issue of whether or not to disclose an internal investigation uh, to the government. Uh, one of the more difficult issues, and I think there's, and a lot of tension, I think, has been created over this issue in the last uh, few years, not just uh, because, uh, and this is number six, which is preserving the attorney-client privilege and how you do it, it not just because um, of the technical issue of how to preserve your attorney-client privilege. There's something else here, and that is that uh, compliance programs rest on transparency. There's a tension between compliance and the need for information and the need for promoting internal information and using transparency as a way uh, to encourage and develop an ethical uh, environment. But there also in number six is um, the other issue, which is that there are moments and there are important times that the privilege is absolutely critical. So there's a tension between ethics and compliance. The chief officer wants to say, look, I've got to get this information out. And the lawyers sit around and say, we need to preserve the privilege. We could have litigation. We could have an investigation, that type of thing. So early on, there has to be a determination about whether or not an investigation, and this comes up more in the internal, obviously, with those that are conducted in a more routine type of situation. And I say routine in quotes. Should the investigation be conducted under the attorney client privilege? The other factor here that's going on that's made this issue more and more difficult is the fact that um, I think that uh, a lot of there's been litigation over attorney client privilege, particularly in the False Claims Act context, where uh, the lawyers are asserting very, very broad claims of privilege as to all compliance documents, including hotline reports, things like that. And uh, the judges are getting frustrated with it, uh, particularly in Florida. You can see a bunch of cases, the federal cases that are coming down where the judges are just absolutely livid at these um, claims of privilege, broad claims, uh, claims of privilege. As a result, lawyers have got to be careful about proper claims of privilege and not over, over broad claims because uh, they're starting to lose credibility on this issue. So that's why uh, this issue is even more important these days as well. So whether or not the investigation should be conducted under the privilege is something that's got to be determined pretty early on. That does not mean if, for example, you are going to commit conduct an investigation under the privilege, it doesn't mean that everybody that's involved has to be a lawyer. This is not the, you know, the Employment Act for lawyers within companies. Um, it means that you have to take steps to protect and preserve the privilege. Um, uh, and you also have to be careful because if you ever waive the privilege or don't have the privilege, uh, you have to be careful about what the implications of that are going to be. So there, there are a lot of issues you have to consider up front in terms of what the importance of this investigation, what would happen with an exposure, and do we need to protect the investigation facts from disclosure because of litigation and reputational risks. So if you're going to preserve the, uh, the privilege, you have to make sure that you um, conduct this under a chief legal officer authorization. Many companies have the general counsel or the chief legal officer authorized uh, the investigation. Um, you want an attorney involved uh, 
in my view, if you're going to do it, have an attorney involved. Um, if you're going to do it just within, within the umbrella of the uh, authorization and then have non-attorneys do it, that's okay too, but I'm just telling you it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and then uh, you want to have an inside attorney, internal attorney involved in terms of the interviews, uh, meetings, everything like that. You want to try to keep that person uh, involved. That makes it the easiest. That doesn't mean that you can't have an internal investigation function that works where you preserve the privilege just under that chief legal officer authorization. But keep in mind, you're definitely taking an additional risk uh, when you don't have an attorney involved in that situation. Obviously, the easiest way to preserve privilege is uh, the outside counsel. Um, now, when you have an attorney, when you're going to preserve the privilege, uh, and in this problem area of the preserving the attorney-client privilege, we always come up to the issue of upjohn warnings. And I say this is a problem only because um, I see too many people trying to uh, sort of, you know, be, be cute in this area, tricking people, making people think. Oh, you know, everything's okay, but I, uh, you know, I can't, you know, go beyond the upjohn warnings. First off, just as a technical matter, upjohn warnings can be given by a non-lawyer. You use, and and I know this is considered heresy, but you have a form that informs them of their rights. You read that form to them. You give that form. Give them a copy of the form. You get a signature from the witness. You sign it yourself as, let's say, you're the you know, doing the, the interview. No tricks, no games, okay? It's too critical an issue. It's becoming litigated now all the time. There's upjohn litigation. And frankly, you don't want to play games with this. It's just too important of an issue. You can undermine the integrity of your investigation. You give upjohn warnings, and you tell people exactly, okay, you tell people exactly you are not representing them, that the privilege belongs to the company, the company can waive it, can do whatever it wants with it. This is a confidential thing, and they're required to cooperate. I mean, they are, as a condition of their employment, required to cooperate. Um, and there's more litigation over this area, and I think it's something that uh, is easy to reduce by just putting in a standard I procedure in a standardized form. You always will get the question, do I need a lawyer, will I lose my job, whatever, from the witness. Do I need a lawyer? Should I get a lawyer? And you tell them, I can't advise you. I can only tell you I'm a company representative. I, my job is to, you know, be a nice person about it, be uh, forward about it, you know, don't be a jerk. And uh, say, look, I can't really help you with that. Um, my job is to, uh, you know, find out the facts for the gov for the uh, company. I, you know, that's my responsibility here. I really can't address that. Um, and, you know, will I lose my job? I don't know. I can't say that you're anything. I can't make any representation as to that. You know, my role is limited to this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you have, you're going to get those questions. They always come up. And then I'll say, well, what's the implications if I sign this? Well, if you sign this, it means that you're agreeing, you understand what your rights are, and that you're agreeing to go forward with this. Well, is this the same as Miranda? No, this is not the same as Miranda. This is not a criminal uh, investigation. You're not under custody. Uh, you're not you know, in, in custody in any situation. You're free to leave at any point. Um, you are required by your employment agreement or whatever your status is here to uh, cooperate with this investigation. Will I lose my job if I don't cooperate? And I say, look, that's a requirement. I don't know if you'll lose your job or not. That's something uh, somebody else would decide. I don't have, I don't uh, make that decision. Those types of questions and answers are going to uh, occur uh, in that situation. So please don't play around with what I would call um, the uh, upjohn warnings, just go forward, do them in the right way, and, um, and standardize the process. The more standardization in the internal investigation process, the less issues, the fewer issues you're going to have. 
Okay, problem number seven is document control, collection, and, you know, uh, lawyers trying to gin up business again uh, with, uh, you know, horrible privacy violations and things like that. Um, your goal early on, obviously, one of the most important ways to get in front of an issue is to get documents. Your IT people are your best friends. You hopefully have talked to them and uh, uh, discussed with them a protocol for how you can get this done. Um, you also probably, hopefully, if you're a global company, in some ways you already have a privacy policy so that you are in compliance with all the privacy laws and regulations around the world. Uh, your major focus, your major focus is going to be on the EU directive on privacy and the various laws within the EU uh, to implement that directive. Uh, it's, that's the big deal and that's what, what you have to be careful about. Now, so let's start first with global collection. Uh, I'm talking about a situation where you have documents, there are servers all over the world, or let's say all your servers are even in the United States, but that's probably not going to be true. Um, but you have, uh, you have to collect all these documents. You should already have, as I'm saying, a global privacy policy, which is going to include as much, uh, you know, sort of protection as you can get, hopefully, in terms of employee consent, your third parties, your third parties and collecting documents is always a is very, very difficult. And you have to make sure that you have contracts with your third parties, your vendors or suppliers, if you need documents from them, uh, to make sure that you can get access to those documents uh, without any um, privacy concerns uh, in, in, uh, to make sure you're in compliance with all of those laws. So you want, your goal is to collect and transfer documents to U.S. locations with one caveat, okay? One caveat, which is remember that sometimes when you bring documents into the United States, it then becomes subject to a grand jury subpoena. Your, grand, your documents that are sitting overseas, let's say on a server in China, are not going to be subject to a grand jury subpoena. As long as they are on a server or reside over in China. If you bring them from China into the United States, which you're, you're usually not able to do, but uh, let's just say another country, uh, you're going to then, um, they will then become uh, under the control of the United States operation and then subject to a grand jury subpoena here. So the concern you have with this situation is um, there may be situations where you will keep documents outside the United States and people will have to travel and people will have to uh, not exercise control over those documents. You would have to travel to look at the documents, uh, to go through the documents, and uh, you will not bring those documents back to the United States. Um, if you bring back copies, you're bringing them back to the United States. So those documents would have to stay over there and you'd have to uh, sort of in review them and investigate them, take notes about them, whatever you want over there and you can use that information. It's the documents that sell, themselves that cannot come back to the United States. If that's your concern, you may not have a grand jury subpoena concern because you're cooperating with the government at that point and you will bring them all back then in that situation. You're only constrained in that situation when you're going to bring them all back and you want to bring them all back is to make sure you comply with all the uh, privacy laws. Now, so there's the EU directive. There are the national laws that implement the directive. There are some companies that put uh, constraints on restriction or on personal communication, even when personal communications are on a uh, computer that is a, a government computer, I mean a uh, company computer. In that situation, there may be con uh, consent that can be obtained uh, to, and under the national law, let's say in Germany and Brazil, where you can't, uh, there are restrictions on uh, your ability to 
um, gain control over personal communications across the border with uh, Germany and take them back to the United States. In any event, your global privacy policy, hopefully you have one, is going to be uh, critical in this sense in terms of how you design and how many trips you have to take. You have to go to London. You have to go somewhere else to uh, review certain documents and what you can uh, review and what you can do with the documents. Um, going back to even more basic things on document control, very early on you issue a broad hold letter uh, to ensure that there's no no destruction of documents. The people are, you basically suspend your document retention policy and your destruction timetables and whatnot. All of that gets suspended by the hold letter. You coordinate with IT, they're your best friends, and uh, you have established procedures or a protocol with IT in terms of investigations and how uh, securing documents and how all of that is going to be uh, held. Well, problem number eight probably is one of the most significant problems, uh, problem areas that I think comes up. And it's going to really depend on, um, you're always going to have difficult conversations and you're always going to have difficult interviews um, and you're going to have people who don't want to cooperate. You're going to have people who are uh, just not, you know, are hiding something. Uh, you're not going to be able to establish it, and you're going to feel kind of rotten that you can't get to this. And um, and I'm going to tell you, most of the times, if not 90% of the time, you can win with what I call sort of the winning interview strategy. Okay, and the reason is. Uh, that I always feel, and maybe it's my idealism, you know, the truth is going to come out eventually. Uh, and if you can't get all of the truth, you're going to get to as close as you can to the truth as to what really occurred. Um, a lot of times people who engage in misconduct really want to disclose the conduct. Um, people, uh, you know, unless you run into the true sociopaths, which you will, um, you've got to have uh, the ability to really use language carefully uh, and to use interpersonal skills. So uh, preparation, and I've done a whole webinar on interviews and how to do interviews, and uh, I'm going to go through some of sort of the highlights of that, but I would urge you to sort of uh, listen to that. It's on the YouTube uh, channel, and uh, I think there it, there's some helpful keys into it. And I, I, frankly, I developed it through you know 20 some years in the government conducting. Um, it just was the way we did everything. So preparation is your key. Uh, you want to have as much uh, information and documents uh, as you can gain about a person. Hopefully, you have some kind of uh, tracking database for employee concerns and investigations to see what you know about this person. You have their HR file. Uh, everything that you can learn about a person who may become, you know, the serious subject of your investigation. Um, patience and professionalism, absolutely. You will never lose your cool. You will never, you will be, and I'm sorry to show my age again, but you will be, like Dragnet, you will be uh, patient and professional, probably not as antiseptic. You're going to be a human. Uh, but you're going to, um, I want you to conduct this interview with a lot of patience and professionalism. You are in control, as I always say. You know the facts. You know what you're digging for. And by the way, uh, I always tell people it's okay to have a second interview, even a third. If you need it, you need it. So don't think that this is a one-shot deal. You may come back. I come back to people absolutely after I've learned more information or whatnot, or things just don't make sense to me, I will go back to that person and, uh, and uh, do another interview or follow up on issues. And it's actually very, very productive because you already know the person. Um, the psychology of an interview is critical. Um, location, 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 not for real estate. Uh, is important. Where are you going to do this? If you're interviewing a senior officer, you can rest assured they're not going anywhere. They're going to sit behind their desk, put their feet on the table, and make you feel as small as possible, especially when they have something to hide. Uh, attendees and witnesses, you always have a witness with you, but do not have a lot of people. I hate that. 
uh, you come in as minimal as you can because you don't you want to make the witness comfortable. When you have a big table filled with people and all these hangers on, you can rest assured you're not going to get cooperation. You are professional. You will always be professional, but you want to be a human being. Crack a few jokes, make a few jokes, show that you're a real person, and conduct the interview with professionalism, but also, you know, be self-deprecating a little bit. You know, hey, spill coffee on myself or whatever. You know, something that's going to show that you're a human being. You talk about your kids if this person has kids as well. Show them that you are real. Um, then you're going to learn, you have to learn to recognize what their tics are. In other words, their deception is. Um, you know, and I always say you watch a person, you watch a person, you look in their eyes. To me, eye contact is absolutely critical. You do not look, one of my big pet peeves, we'll go through some of my pet peeves in a minute, is when you don't look at the person and you have a list of questions. You're not going to read a list of questions. You're not going to do it. You may have a list of sort of subject areas that you've got to make sure you cover, but you're otherwise going to just formulate your own questions as you're going along. Um, no signed statements, no signed statements, because people can change their version of events. Things can come up. You don't want to have signed statements. You memorialize the interview, including your impressions of credibility, as you're sort of building into your final report. Uh, you do not record people, never record people, no take video interviews, do not take audio interviews. This is a conversation because that gives you a little bit more flexibility as you're developing your um, technique. Successful interviews, you're not the police, you're not a friend, you have, you're a professional and you develop your own uh, rapport. Please, you do not write out every question or read from a list. You maintain eye contact with the witness at all times. You ask easy questions in the beginning to let them to, to you know, get them to relax. You do not argue with the witness. You do not become emotional. You are a machine, but a nice guy, a nice woman, nice person. You're going to be a nice person. You're going to be a real person. Um, and you always uh, allow them to tell their story. Okay, you always allow them to tell your story. Do not ask leading questions. You always start with the whole story. Let them tell the whole story from beginning to end without documents, without anything. Oh, and then what happened? And then what did you do? Oh, I get it. I see. And then what do you do? Uh, and then what do you do? And then what do you do? Now, one question came in, and I think it's a really good one. What about phone interviews? I would only do phone interviews. Um, you know, it depends on the nature of the of the um, investigation. Um, but to me, a phone interview is where you need information, where credibility isn't that important. You just need basic information to round out your report. I would never do a phone interview with anybody on an important issue. If it's somebody's job that's on the line or somebody's conduct is really serious or um, uh, it's a critical witness in something, I would not do that. I'd much rather have somebody, let's say, that's located in China and I'm in the United States and somebody on the compliance team do it where face-to-face uh, -face, where I would tell, you know, sort of brief them in advance and have them do it. If that's, if we have a constraint like that, I'm, I want to get the human interaction if I can. Obviously, there are times you always have to make judgment calls or you have to have resource constraints, but um, I try to avoid uh, phone interviews uh, as much as I can. Um, uh, another uh, question is, what if they want to record the interview? I tell them, no, they can't record the interview. We, uh, that's a, we have a policy, and frankly, I would put that in your policy uh, statement. You should have, and I've been working with companies now to develop uh, internal investigation uh, guidelines, and I'll put that in the internal investigation guidelines. Nobody is going to record anything. Um, and uh, you know, look, if it's not as a condition of their employment, they have to follow your policies and procedures. And if you have an internal investigation guidelines that are set out, uh, I would never let them record it. Um, in any event, you don't write out every question. Like I said, maintain eye contact. I'm telling you that's the way. Number one, you put the most pressure on somebody if you um, look in their eyes. Uh, if you look at their eyes, 
and go from there. If, on the other hand, um, you um, uh, you need to look, you know, down at something, that's fine. But please do it only for a little bit. Ask easy questions. Obviously, we said don't argue or become emotional. Um, then, after you get the whole story out, after you get the 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 their whole story, we're going to go back over the story, and you're going to have documents hopefully that are going to constrain things, or you're going to have uh, issues that where you can sort of test the, the the story because it sounds incredible after a while, or there's something that's missing. That's where you're going to constrain them. I'm telling you, 99% of the time, you will never get a confession. Nobody confesses. Very, very rarely do you ever get a confession. What you're going to get is you're going to basically push them into a corner in a successful interview, is you're going to have them pushed into a corner constrained by documents and other knowledge that you know from other witnesses that's more credible where you can find what they're saying is incredible. And you can do that in your internal investigation uh, report. And that's where you're ultimately aiming for. Um, if a person wants to tell you something, they will tell it to you. I had a client who on the first time they were approached about an antitrust cartel, uh, said only a little bit, and then called back and said, I want to meet with you again. And that person wanted to tell. They wanted to tell from the beginning because they couldn't do something wrong. Unlike the sociopath who ran the whole cartel, this person who was part of it and was behind it or was enlisted into it or did certain things to help in it wanted to tell the whole thing. And that's the person you want to get to. That's the person you want to encourage. It doesn't take that long to get to that person. The, per the more difficult one is when you talk to the sociopath who will lie and has no problem denying it. So persistence, professional persistence, is what I call the most important part of an internal investigation interview strategy. You also want to, and for whatever reason, I think it's a, it's a male trait, and I hate to be sexist, but men are just impossible at asking the hard questions. They can't ask the direct questions. You always have to ask the $64,000 question and get their explanation on the record. Did you steal, at some point during the interview at the end, you say, okay, did you steal the six, you know, the $6 million from uh, you know, this company? And you watch, watch the reaction. Now, they're probably going to be so prepared for that, you won't get many tells from that. But you have to get them on the record and get an explanation for it. Uh, and you want to have that explanation because that's important to show uh, that everything was asked and it goes into your overall uh, judgment as well. Uh, in honor of Dr. Spock, resolving factual issues is problem number nine. Usually as your investigation goes along, you, the picture becomes clearer. The credibility is important in your determinations of witnesses. Credibility is important. And you need to make sure that you are um, taking the human element, and I, I know that's contrary to Spock, but you're taking the human element into your factual determination. You have a careful analysis of the evidence based on the documents and the interviews, but you've got to weigh the, the alternative scenarios here as to what is logical. You're going to avoid conspiracy theories. I tell you this uh, because many, many times people see conspiracies and they don't exist. Okay, the simplest answer is often the right one is what I'm saying, or the clearest answer is usually the right one. Um, but remember the context of your case. In other words, what type of investigation you're conducting, uh, how many people are implicated. Remember also who your audience is. Is the board, the management, the government. Think about that as you start to resolve factual issues because who are you going to have to persuade? How are you going to persuade them? Are there going to be people who resist this interpretation? And if that's true, you've got to start to resolve the issues and analyze the issues in a way thinking about who your audience is. But often the, 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 the tip in the balance, the bal on a close case, the balance is going to be tipped based upon credibility determinations. And in that sense, because usually, look, when you start with a conflict of the interest type of thing, uh, it becomes very clear, uh, usually their financial records. If there's theft, you're going to have records. Uh, those types of things. 
Um, so there's usually going to be documents which point you in the right direction. The harder cases are cases without documents where it's a he said, she said, but not an employment type of matter. Uh, but you're going to have a situation where credibility is going to become the determinant. And in that situation, you've got to be watch for the human element, element document the credibility of the determination as you go along. And you'll see that those credibility determinations will stack up and make it very clear what, uh, uh, what's going to happen. But you have to do it dispassionately. You have to do it without uh, you know, any prejudice or bias or anything like that. Somebody may be a pain in the ass when you talk to them, but they're entitled to, you know, what I call organizational justice. Report writing is very critical, as, uh, and you can see where I'm going with this in terms of you making your factual determinations. I've been reviewing uh, reports in various companies and been struck at how poor they are. This is not rocket science, and the reporting is usually done in these really bizarre formats. It's hard to tell what is the allegation, what happened, where, what did we do, how did we do the investigation, what did we find out, and here's our analysis of the evidence. Boom, substantiated, unsubstantiated. And follow your burden of proof and always and always the elements of the offense. What are the elements of a conflict of interest offense. What are the elements of a theft? Just show what it is and start all of it. And I work with companies here to define offenses, create a standardized process, create guidelines, go to, you know, go by, as they call them, and forms for to make sure that you, you get the proper consistency in your internal investigation, uh, internal investigation function. You do not, in your report, make a recommendation as to what the sanction should be. You just make the findings and you go from there. That's not your call. When you write your report, you've got to know who's on your side and you've got to know who's against you and you've got to hold those enemies closer. You build your credibility through high quality work. I can't say that more often. Somebody may be against you, but I'll tell you this. If you do high quality work, it makes it harder and harder for them to sabotage you. Um, you make sure you provide your accused and your complainants opportunities to submit any information. You always have that with them individually where you say any other information you have. You coordinate your results and your actions with your friends, legal, audit, HR. Those constituations are going to be with you and you always reiterate on retaliation. You draw conclusions. Okay, carefully considering the facts, you apply with its credibility determination. Uh, you always do uh, do that. Uh, one person asked me a question real quickly, which I do want to respond to. Do you permit questions in, from witnesses to each other? And the answer is no. Uh, you, they're never with each other. Uh, you're not going to allow them to say, well, go ask Joe this. You're not going to do that. And you never mention. And when you're interviewing one person, you do not say, well, Joe Blow told us this about you. What do you say to that? Do not do that. You keep each witness and interview separate. You just make it your question. That's all. Uh, so you draw conclusions. You carefully consider the facts. You use your judgment. You follow the burden of proof. And you document the reasons for your decision. And ultimately, hopefully, if there's some information that is used, you're going to remediate as well. The last issue and the last problem, and I know we're running a little bit late, is one issue, which is how to report internally. Remember this. Sometimes there are companies that are not preparing a written report. The practitioner basically conducts an investigation and writes down the interview notes and all of that and then has a presentation that's done orally to the board, and the minutes indicate there was a board. Uh, the, the reason that that is a judgment call is you have to consider in the context of a non, you're not cooperating with the government at this point, or you weren't uh, at this point, is do you want that to be discoverable later on? I frankly think the risk of it being discoverable is pretty low. Um, you know, in a shareholder suit or something else, or the government goes after it. Because if you do it by privilege, uh, you should be able to protect it. But the resolution really depends on the context of the documentation. Um, and you want to make sure that you have documentation that's going to fix certain 
you know, establish certain things that you may need. For example, that the board can monitor this investigation. The audit committee did. That there was uh, a remediation defense, so you did remediate the problem. How was the problem discovered, and what were the reports concerning initial discovery? You, you have to make sure if you're not going to have a report that has the important things in there, that you're going to have corporate documentation in the minutes of the meeting that make reference to very generally, but, uh, but give you enough of the facts that you can establish them for the government's purposes uh, if, for example, you get led to that point. Sorry to rush through the end there. Uh, just to remind you, we're out here. We help a lot with uh, internal investigations. We conduct them on certain issues. We uh, do training on internal investigations for people on interviews, on uh, things like that. We also help to establish internal investigation programs with guidelines and how you're going to uh, how you're going to um, you know conduct your investigations to make that a public internally within the company as part of a speak up culture doctor, uh, presentation to say we have these guidelines they're available if you want them uh, you know they're on our intranet these are public things uh, anyways if you do want a copy of these slides please uh, email me uh, follow uh, our writing on corruption crime and compliance uh, follow us on LinkedIn like us and follow us on Facebook and we have the YouTube channel and of course there's our website which talks about uh, the services we provide uh, in terms of compliance, but enforcement defense, but mainly here, internal investigation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and again, if you do have any other questions that I couldn't do, uh, get to, um, uh, I would uh, you know, feel free to write me. I'll uh, be happy to respond uh, and happy to help in any way that I can. Thank you again, and uh, I appreciate your attending.